morning. I was asked to, or we were asked actually to talk about uh, the future. It's kind of interesting, it's like the Christmas Carol. We just heard the past and the present, and we're now going to try to lay down a game plan for the future of NAI. It works out that planning for this, I didn't really know what to do, but I ended up by finding an article which landed on my desk, a, a journal called Business Officer, which obviously I'm not a business officer, but I'm from Nukobo. And it says inside, revenue for refill. And of course, a whole page of dollars and everything. So I looked inside of it, and there's a, a small article inside of this, which really addresses commercialization of research and intellectual property. And it was quite fascinating to see the bent that this person put on it. Because it works out that that's really what we're going to be talking about, at least aspects of it. And since this organization has administrators of all levels, researchers and teachers of all disciplines, the young and the old, and obviously a proven ability for innovation. The article itself, though, is really somewhat misleading because it works out there are really 5,000 research uh, uh, universities and colleges in the United States. Probably 10% of them actually do technology transfer. And it's debatable, some of those, whether they're any good or not. And by the way, I can say that because I've been actually a vice president for research for 25 years, actually starting here at the University of South Florida. I'm not being critical, but it really takes five to seven years for a company to make money, thus pay back a university. Licensing can be slow, and with governors now coming along saying that 15, 10, 15 percent of the, of the university's budget could come from licensing and commercialization. That's a rather frightening thought process. And I might point out that over the last uh, 25 years, we've averaged about 10 new companies from the university per year for that period of time. I say that to kind of lay down a preamble, because I'd like to switch to really not the University of South Florida but really where I started down here, because obviously I was from the Rust Belt. I came from Akron, Ohio. So the question really is, can one take the principles of a, of a, of a research university and move it back into Akron, Ohio, into Northeast Ohio? And to do that, one has to be a little bit tricky, because it snows there. Nobody really wants to be there. They'd rather be down here, as I knew. And so the question really is, is can you in fact use what here is at University of South Florida, and now all of the universities in Florida, can you in fact use that as a model with inside of the university, university system across the uh, land? But to do it, I have to tell three stories. Because it's the three stories which really make a lot of things happen. First of all, when I moved back to Akron, which I had left in 1968, a lot had changed. And it's that change that was really negative to the particular environment. And could you change it? And after spending about three years, a, a dear friend came into my office one day and he said, George, he says, I've just retired. I'd like to come and work for you. Now, when you're in South Florida, everybody in the South comes down here and they ask the same question. The only problem is they have their hand out. They want to be paid. And I said, sure, I'd be ever too glad to give you a job, but if there's no pay. Not only is there no pay, I will be ever too glad to give you an office. I'll give you a computer. I'll give you a place to, to work, a secretary. I'll give you whatever you want, but I'll not pay you. So he started out. His name is Barry Rosenbaum. He's actually an I-Corps rep now uh, in Michigan in part-time. He drives up himself. About a month or two later, in walks a guy from Goodyear said exactly the same thing. And I made them both senior fellows of the Research Foundation. No pay, but I'll pick up their expenses. After eight years, I now have ten people working me for, for nothing. Full-time, ten hours a day, five days a week. And as we got started, it worked out that we needed to figure out how do you draw the community. Because here is where I'm going to be slightly different than the rest of the people who are talking. And that is, 
I do not believe that the university is a unique individual, a unique organization unto a community. I think it's actually the other way around. We have to bring the community into the university, which the university is in essence a part of it. So we started an Archangel Network, Akron Change Angels. The idea is to have the community be part of this particular operation. I'm rambling here for a second because I think it's so important if we're going to start to look at the future that we have to look at the community that we, that we, that we deal with. The first meeting was in 2005. We had 33 people show up. This last one which we had on Thursday, which I missed because I was down here, there are now 650. All donating time, sweat equity. And the only thing I've done is I pay for the cookies, the wine, the cheese. And we have our own beer. We have Roo Brew. And we, in fact, have these, this group of people listening to the companies present. By the way, they've also raised the people who come there are going to be offering their talents into this overall environment, not money. The 80-some the, the companies that are now presented have raised $430 million in Akron, Ohio. Now, I say that because that really lays down the, the, the community. What is the community? And by the way, each university in this room, including the University of South Florida, we all have to look at the community that we really help the most. It isn't going to be Anchorage, Alaska. It's not going to be someplace foreign to us. It will have to be close. And if you look at Akron, it's really right in the center of Northeast Ohio. There's six million people in Northeast Ohio. There are five state universities in that system. There are probably 20 to 30 small universities. But also there's 2,000 plus polymer companies and chemical companies. And it dawned on me that as I'm trying to start these companies at the university, and I'm starting five to 10 per year, how am I ever going to possibly make a dent in anything? Because who's going to be starting then a second company or a third company? I'm going to run out of people before I run out of the technology. So now that I've got these people at my disposal, I ask them a very simple question. Since, in fact, there's probably 10,000 to probably 50,000 patents in Northeast Ohio in the chemical industry there. Goodyear is three miles from us. Firestone, now Bridgestone, just to further south. I want to know who out there has technology that they no longer use. Is it, in fact, bundleable? So out they went. They came back. So, ah, Goodyear. Now, Goodyear is the most conservative company in the United States of America. They, in fact, have a new technology that they, in fact, found really doesn't fit a rubber tire. By the way, a lot of things don't. We, the, the university's research foundation, licensed it. I sick these guys back out, and I said, OK, find a company that wants this technology. They went out. And we found a, a company in Germany, a very large company, who, in fact, this summer will start insulating European houses with this technology. Goodyear gets the money from this, so the community is a little better. I've in, in, in introduced a new environmental friendly commercial product into Europe. It will be here in the United States because they're here as well. And you might say, what did I get out of it? I shouldn't say I, what we get out of it. We have what is known as a finder's fee. And a finder's fee is 5% off the top. So it works out that you're really not doing anything, but you're taking things which are here. The university and the research foundation allows you then to start to build a new model. And I'm going to tell you one more, and there's really a lot of these. I'm going to tell one more, and that's Timken. And I'm going to tell you because this morning MIT is talking with the National Academy in Washington and then on to the Congress to tell you about this. So you're going to know it slightly before they are. It works out that they had a marginal technology but it made money for them. What it was is a coating of ball bearings, or not ball bearings, of roller bearings. And this technology is putting a micro layer over the top of the, of the bearing. Doing this, the bearing lasts three times longer and they make ten times more money. It's a very simple, straightforward project. But the problem is they needed more space. So they came to the university and said, well, we would love to move our research facilities out of Timken 
We will help you put up a building. We'll fund the, the faculty to be in that. And we're going to move one of our people there and shut the place down, this research facility. And, in, and by the way, they're in Canton. They're 10 miles south of us. Well, all of that has taken place. We now have it up and running. They've given the equipment to the Research Foundation. We donated to the university. But it, it, that isn't really the cute part of this whole thing. The cute part is they came back and they said, by the way, would you be interested in manufacturing this? Now, that's a little bit different. But it, to my knowledge, I don't know of any research foundation or university that actually is truly in the manufacturing business. So the Research Foundation set up a new company, ASTI, 80% owned by, the, by the, the Research Foundation, 20% 20 by, 20 by Timken. And by the way, Timken is giving the rest of their equipment and everything to us. We ended up by finding a friend who had an empty building, a, a huge machine company, National Machine, in Stowe, about five miles north of us. And in fact, Timken will be our first customer. There's no way of losing. You know, you stop and think about it. Again, we own all the technology, but what occurs is this is going to be really one of these changes. And that's why I'm bringing the story up today, because we as a society can no longer look to the past, but we must look to the future to figure out how do we, in fact, take full advantage of that technology, which is, in fact, patented, which is up on shelves. It isn't necessarily at university, but is in all of the community around us. And by the way, to make sure that this is successful, and since Timken is a part owner of this, and they have a sales staff worldwide, they will in fact advertise it for us. I don't think there's any doubt this is the start to an awful lot of people starting to think different ways about what's in the community and how does a university really play a role, all based on uh, intellectual property. So we have to think out of the box. And I guess the, the last comment that I want to make, and I'm talking far too long, and that is the Cleveland Clinic, which is about 30 miles north of us, uh, an incredible health center, although it may not be after hearing Leroy Hood's comments today. They have a seminar series called Ideas for, the Ideas for Tomorrow series. And I would suggest opening up a conversation after Elizabeth has given her talk and, and to really look at how do we deal with tomorrow? How do we take advantage of what each of us have, and how do we, in fact, pass that information on to the next person, and how do we help them be successful? Thank you, George. Uh, like George, I have a few brief prepared remarks um, that I'd like to present, um, and then I will be going out into the audience to uh, get your feedback, because this session really is about you and your opportunity to provide feedback and input for the future direction of the NAI. At the start of 2013, academia may be facing an identity crisis. Criticism and concern regarding cost and benefit is leveled from all angles. Parents, lawmakers, students themselves. With the rise of digital technology and the crunch of economies, uncertainty seems to grow stronger about the future of the academic model with each new semester. To quote one prominent university president, a tsunami is coming. I have to apologize for starting under such an ominous guise. It's short-lived, though, I promise. But because perhaps a tsunami is about to hit academic institutions, Actually, a tsunami has been hitting the academy, but not with the waves of despair and dread, but with a flood of new ideas and enthusiasm belong, that belongs to a generation of new young people as they set out to forge their identities and sharpen their minds. That will never change. What is changing, however, is the relationship that exists between education, technology, and commerce a crossroads that has become so bustling and complex that it is confusing, even frightening, to aspiring entrepreneurs and innovators. How do universities continue their traditional roles when they must also offer a useful product 
in exchange for the investments students and their families make. There is a growing need for organizations that can help shepherd new ideas and, and enthusiasm through that terminal and work in tandem with universities, business, and government. The National Academy of Inventors is one such organization. The NAI is an important collaborator for academic organizations as they advance their missions. Universities create pools of innovations and inventors that drive American industry and the economy. But we should never forget that universities exist first and foremost to educate and inspire. By, promising intellectual, by promoting intellectual property and technology transfer at universities, the NAI acts as an important bridge and helps shoulder the responsibility of preparing students for commercial enterprise while allowing universities to prepare and protect their traditional identity as centers for learning. The NAI can also offer guidance to government agencies, particularly the United States Patent and Trademark Office, as we look for new ways to promote innovation in the academic space, which we recognize as one of the most important incubators for technological development in the United States. Through the Office of Innovation Development, the USPTO is working on outreach programs and building a coalition of government agencies and universities to promote innovation. We participate in the Interagency Network of Enterprise Assistance Providers and the Interagency Working Group on Technology Transfer, known by the acronym INEAP and IAWGTT. Let's all make a note of those. Uh, these working groups are made up of other government agencies that work with universities, particularly the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We are helping to address concerns and answer questions over the ongoing changes in patent law that these agencies feel might impact their university stakeholders. Here again, the NAI can help the USPTO in its relationship with other government agencies. The USPTO is also working directly with universities to promote intellectual property and to make the system more accessible at all levels. In a little bit, Commissioner Focarino will talk even more about this, but I'd like to point to one such collaboration, and that is what the collaboration the USPTO currently has with Cornell University. Last October, the USPTO announced a program to install a full-time employee at Cornell's Tech Campus in New York City. The representative serves as a valuable resource for intellectual property issues at the campus and provides student and faculty inventors a direct channel with the USPTO. And I should mention as a side note that Dr. Sandberg has made an offer to make space available here should the USPTO be able to position a person here in South Florida. But obviously the USPTO cannot station a representative at every university. In the near future, we will depend upon the expertise of organizations like the NAI to be surrogates for intellectual property advocacy and education at the universities. Whether this is by assisting in the patent process or by serving in more formal capacities to connect universities with government agencies and business enterprises. At this point, I would like to mention another university that is setting a strong example for academic institutions as they confront the future and maneuver to remain at the forefront of innovation in the United States. Recently, Purdue University, whose provost, Dr. Tim Sands, is here today or arriving shortly, announced that they were changing the rules to their intellectual property policy to allow students to retain sole control of patents on inventions and discoveries resulting from normal coursework. Purdue's Office of Commercialization has already begun approaching students that create intellectual property under these conditions and offering assistance and support on the patent process and commercialization. Forgive me for not mentioning other universities who may have similar programs in place, but this is the kind of news the USPTO loves to hear. The NAI can help in this new model for university technology transfer 
by continuing their mission to promote and inspire innovation. They can also help to shape new policies, ones that offer new opportunities for students, but also respect the longstanding and important research and development endeavors that universities support and rightfully retain control over. Here's another kind of news story that we love to hear. Last week, I read about a newly patented invention, a prosthetic arm robotically controlled by brain waves. It was put together for about $250 in materials, and it was invented by a 17-year-old, who is still, in fact, trying to decide which college to attend. I'm pleased to announce that every week I read stories like this. Ladies and gentlemen, kids are inventing real inventions. They are patenting them, and they are applying to a college near you. Universities that encourage intellectual property by opening the doors immediately to inventorship will be the ones that attract the greatest talent. By fostering the importance of patents at early stage in the development of students, universities can ensure the continued success of the system and the continued process, progress of the human species. The NAI has a real opportunity here, but the challenge is this. As we are about to open the floor to discuss, where does the NAI go from here? The temptation is to continue doing what you're doing, because in fact, you are doing it so well. And let's be honest, change is hard. Mark Twain once wrote, a country without a patent office and strong patent laws is just a crab and can't travel anyway, but sideways and backwards. Well, the NAI is no crab, nor for that matter is it a manatee or a grouper, perhaps more locally relevant. However, our goal here today for George and I is to assist Dr. Sandberg and to assist all of you in, in ensuring that the NAI continues moving forward in all that it does. So with that, I am going to have George maintain the floor here, and I am going to come out amongst you and elicit your feedback. Don't be shy, because I will, I will come to you. Are there any comments? Are there any ideas? Silence is not appropriate. I could just randomly approach one of you, and then you'll have no choice but to speak. <laughs> All right, I see someone in the back, our first hand. You know, opportunity doesn't really knock every day of the week here, so. Barbara Hansen from the University of South Florida. I thoroughly enjoyed this morning's session, and, um, and it came to me that this organization has the ability to help new inventors and encourage new inventors by focusing on uh, the bumps in the road and what I call the hands up, that is the facilitators. And I wonder if we might want to think about that for the next meeting so that we include some young people who can articulate where those bumps are and how they got over them, if they did. Those bumps may still be there. And, uh, and what facilitation we can uh, uh, help with. Great, thank you, Barbara. Wonderful suggestion. I think I saw a hand here earlier. Yes. Hello, my name is Mary Andrews with Boise State University, and I really appreciate the National Academy of Inventors for encouraging the kind of culture um, change and the opportunity to take risks within our organization uh, to improve. Thank you. I know this group is not shy. I've been with you long enough to know that about you, so. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Bloom. I'm with Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. We're located in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, so I'm probably one of the folks who's going to be staying a few extra days. I won't complain. At my institution, uh, there is no tenure process. Uh, all of the faculty members are simply called senior research scientists, uh, whether they're in the first year of their career or the 25th year of their career. 
And what that does is that it frees them to do whatever they want to do. And it's amazing that even given that freedom, uh, that they do things that are very positive, not only for their academic careers, uh, but for the community. Our institution is viewed as an economic you know, engine for our region. Uh, we receive money from the state, the federal government, uh, in the area of uh, ocean research. And having worked for large universities earlier in my career, uh, one of the frustrations, particularly from younger faculty members, is that they would tell the tech transfer folks that, yes, I would really like to be involved in what you do, but it really has no impact on my career. And I think one of the areas that the academy, can, if they can focus, is to change the attitudes, particularly at larger institutions, that really put um, commercialization activity, technology transfer, company startup, community connections uh, as a part of the tenure process and make that an important aspect of what they do. And you will see a lot more faculty members participate, particularly the younger faculty members. Uh, and a second aspect I think that would be very important, we see that in our region, is that working with universities to allow them to connect to local companies, to allow those local companies to participate uh, with universities that are in their communities uh, through faculty consultation or the lived in northwestern Ohio, uh, I can attest to the challenge of uh, getting people to work together. So thank you. Thank Bar you. Barry's here in the center. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is very interesting. And I'm, uh, I'm Barry Burkue. I spent a good part of my academic career here at USF. And now I wear a different hat. Uh, consulting for a, a central commercial IRB. And I mentioned the, yesterday to the young lady who gave the great presentation from Stevens Institute, uh, what is relevant for many of the inventors here, but not all, are the ones that go into the, the clinic. Well, the bump in the road is that whole IRB process and what you have to go through and the time that can be uh, lost, and I think uh, the NIA could be very helpful and um, create, creative and help educate people, especially when they have zero experience uh, about that whole process and the time it can take. Uh, so this is very important in terms of uh, commercialization, I, I believe. Since I know a few of the people, how about Rathinder in the back? <laughs> and I should mention, lest you think your suggestions are falling on deaf ears, we are recording the session and the ideas will be collected from that recording. Thank you, George, for putting me on this spot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think I find it fascinating that all of us are talking about same thing, same issues, same solution. Um, every university or research university has really strong business college. And, uh, and many universities have Center for Entrepreneurship where those business students are really taking courses and hands-on training. Uh, I wonder how many universities are engaging uh, those business colleges with the technology transfer office uh, to take really uh, advantage of their talent. Um, at the University of Houston, I have given a contract to the Center for Entrepreneurship with $100,000 a year to borrow their student. So anytime we have an invention disclosure and one of these students reading the disclosure and putting a business plan uh, so that the uh, inventors know uh, what challenges might uh, lie ahead because I don't want it to license the technology to faculty members is spin up companies, not knowing they can really take this technology anywhere. And essentially, if they cannot, uh, they're going to kill your technology. They're going to kill the patent, well, uh, patent life, and you won't be able to uh, market that technology. So I think I would encourage uh, each one of you to take a look at your business college 
and engage them to the best possible ways uh, so that he can get some advantage uh, in marketing the technology or at least getting some realistic picture which technology you can market and which one you cannot market. So you need partners for development. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds like a session for next year's annual meeting. Elizabeth Pierre. Right. I'm Felix Okoje, Jackson State University, and also a member of the Board of Directors. Um, this organization, I'm speaking to the internal aspects of it, is only going to be as strong as the members that it is composed of. Uh, I want to speak to the growth in terms of membership. I think the growth of membership of this organization has to rest with each and every one of us. Uh, we heard the president say that hopefully next year we would have doubled the membership stake. So if every one of us here can bring in one or two more universities, it will be very much easy to meet that goal. So uh, unlike organizations that only depend upon the leadership of such organizations to uh, bring about such growth, you know, what we know is that it's always very difficult to do that. But if every one of us here who are already charter members can be strong advocates for the organization, I think the sky is the limit for all of us. The second aspect I want to uh, speak to for the group is the issue of fundraising. Uh, again, strong organizations need resources to be able to do some of the creative and exciting things you've seen the last year and a half and what some of the members are advocating here this morning. Uh, fundraising is also a membership game. You know, each and every one of us needs to be able to not only help, but also identify other funding mechanisms by which this organization can play a part and have the resources to do the type of things that all of us collectively uh, want to do. So those are the two things that I think uh, are very critical uh, as we move NAI you know, forward, collective responsibility and collective engagement of our members. Thank you, Felix. So it's Vineet Njauan from Boston University. Um, I think NAI has done a fabulous job of celebrating a mentorship. It's very clear. Something that's coming facing us, I think you alluded to it a bit, is that a lot of the funding that comes for these inventors comes from the taxpayer. And that funding is going to go down no matter what happens, whether it's sequestration or any other way. I think NAI could actually um, create maybe a working group to look at how foundation and corporations could be encouraged to step in to provide increased funding. There are a lot of reasons why that's not hap happening now. I, you know, I fight this daily at my own university, conflict of interest issues, um, no business development. So these kind of things, and I think NAI could play a, a catalyst role, and I for one would be willing to volunteer in a working group around corporate and, corporate and foundation uh, you know, thinking of how we could encourage them to uh, to bring more funding into universities. Thank you. A couple of quick things. My name is Rose Glee. I am from Florida and M University. Um, first, I'd like to agree with Elizabeth that kids are indeed in inventors. Um, in at around 2005, I had the opportunity through a Partnership for Innovation grant from the National Science Foundation to uh, do two innovative kinds of things. One was to essentially do what the gentleman said back there and use uh, graduate students in the Office of Technology Transfer, graduate students from the School of Business as well as students from the law school. And it made the difference in my shop. But the, the thing that I really want to tell you is how a um, successful a, a pilot program I ran for five years for middle-aged kids 
uh, as a, a, in an invention camp. Out of that camp, um, several, uh, any number of innovative kinds of uh, developments came out of there. One, uh, we filed several patents. One has been issued, and we've received a notice of alliance on a second. And these are middle school school kids. And I'd like the uh, academy to to consider either supporting this kind of program so we, that we grow inventors, uh, because they do grow up to become not only members of our institutions, but become uh, researchers. Two of, those, two of the kids um, who will receive a patent soon have, um, are, are in school at Florida a &M University, and a third is at UCF. And they all tri attribute the camp to inspiring them to go into the STEM disciplines. It's really exciting. Thank you. Uh, well, I, uh, I don't have any great ideas, but I know one thing for sure, and that is like any enterprise, especially a young enterprise, you have to focus to really have an impact. And I really think that the, uh, I'll say the board of NAI, needs to identify a couple of, just a few, key issues or problems to attack over the next couple of years at a very high level and make a real impact on all of us in academia that are on the inventive side of things. So I think there's an entire ecosystem for invention and tech transfer and education. Um, all these partners that you pointed to, Paul, uh, earlier, I think are all fine partners. But I really encourage us to, uh, to focus and just pick a couple key issues. Elizabeth? Thank you. Right here in front. I see we have another one here in front. Um, I do want to also put out a call to all of our fellows in the audience to see if they would like to offer any feedback as well. You know, I think this issue of uh, tenure and what you evaluate for tenure is really a critical one. And uh, so I'm Lee Hood at the Institute for Systems Biology. I remember in 1973 when I was, I'd been three years at Caltech, when my chair came in and said, he urged me in this, this is a department of biology, he urged me in the strongest possible terms to give up all this technology stuff and focus on biology. And I didn't, and that was at the behest of the senior faculty who felt it was unseemly to have engineering in a biology department. And I will say that that attitude didn't change over the 20 years I was at Caltech. And that basically is why I left Caltech, which is uh, actually really a great place. But the point I would make, I've heard 100 people say, oh, we've got to persuade them to take a much more liberal view toward uh, tenure and things like that. And I haven't heard any really concrete suggestions on how to do that. The nubbin of the matter is senior people that have a view of what tenure is, and they aren't going to change it easily. And if you're going to change that, you have to think it through very deeply and present a compelling argument which suggests there really is need for change. And I have yet to hear anybody who's had one original thought in that regard. So if we are to go in this direction, it's a non-trivial problem, and I think thinking about it deeply uh, and putting forth a series of arguments could really, really be useful, but it's not trivial. Can I just, because it's now 11.20 for the next session, but the last two, Eric's, Leroy, you let in the one from uh, Maine, you let into one of the areas that we want to focus on that we've thought about clearly, which is the uh, issue of promotion tenure, uh, those aspects, there's so many different fields, but that's one that we'd like to do a white paper on uh, from this academy. Um, and so that's why it leads, you guys must have just led right into uh, the next uh, forum, which is really, although it has a cute title about Edison, it's uh, really about these issues. And so uh, maybe that's the place to stop. 
we've recorded those great ideas, especially the ones about young children. Uh, a lot of the chapters are involved in that. We have that here. We had 600 um, uh, inventions submitted by uh, K through 8 to this university where our academy, local academy evaluated them uh, from schools in eight counties. And the winner last year, we announced, had an issued patent on Edison's birthday last week. And, uh, and of course, the home to, as seen on TV, you see that, but wait, you know, there's something else. And that's in Tampa. They did an infomercial and their marketing. So this is a, this is a, a fifth grader. So it's quite interesting. So that's very important to these kinds of things. Um, but it, this really leads into the whole idea of, of, of tenure. And so if we could move into that, that would be great, because this is such an important topic. It's interesting how that came up during just an open discussion. 